Okay, so first of all, thank you guys very much for doing this interview, but more importantly, thanks for what you do as a career. You know, I think that's something that probably I suspect you don't hear often enough, but I, you know, I want to send out my sincerest thanks, and I, I, I think I speak for the whole community. Uh, we certainly appreciate what our ranchers do, whether they're cattle ranchers or bison ranchers. And I mean, you guys are doing the hard work that feeds us. And you know, I think a lot of people have no idea how difficult that work can be. I've, I've, I've had the pleasure of visiting many ranches and speaking with a lot of ranchers. But you guys, the first time I got to talk to some bison ranchers, so I'm I'm pretty excited about that. So if you guys don't mind, can you get just each take a moment to give us a little bit about your background story and tell us who you are, where you're from, what led you into becoming bison ranchers? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for having us on, Sean. It really means a lot. Thank you for taking interest in what we're doing. But I'm Scott Osmond uh, from, from Mission, South Dakota. It's on the Rosebud and Indian Reservation, the south central part of South Dakota. Um, my family originally moved up here, you know, from down Nebraska in the early 1900s. Um, we were in, we they settled in Tripp County, and then when my grandpa was in high school, he was the youngest boy, wasn't married. So he got sent out to the reservation for that, that part of the operation. And that's where we're still ranching today. Um, uh, I ranch with a farm and ranch with my dad, my mom, and my wife, and now my one-year-old son, Ted. So uh, we, uh, we, we've been in the, our family, the Osmonds have been in cattle for since the beginning, you know, ever since we were in this area. And uh, we started farming. We transitioned to organic in 1997 when I was one year old. And uh, we we were my my dad. He was raising registered Angus cattle, and we we're doing all that all the way up through you know recently. But when I was in college, uh, the cattle prices really started to tank. Um, you know, beef cattle, and we were looking for something that fit our model better, you know, we're looking for something more sustainable, uh, something that just fit our operation better. We're already farming organically. And the beef cattle, um, first of all, we weren't, there was no profit. And, you know, the fact is taking all the profit off the top. And we are looking for something to just fit that better, something we can control better. Um, so I started looking in the bison industry when I was, you know, there in college, and then we just happened to start asking around, and in uh, to late 2016, early 2017, we decided we were going to get into the industry, so we bought a few animals, uh, you know, I think that first bunch we bought was about 180 head of uh, two-year-old heifers, and we still had our beef cattle, and after that first blizzard, we had decided that it was... Uh, we were, you know, all of our beef cows, we were putting out hay for them, uh, really having to bathe them, and the buffalo were south standing there on the hilltop, you know, just uh, just having a grand old time, you know, zero degree weather, you know, 30 mile an hour wind. So that's when we realized we had made the right decision. So then we transitioned out of all of our beef cows, and now we are all bison, and we run, oh, we're running about 850 cow-calf pairs right now. I'll let Alex introduce himself. No, thank you. Thank you guys for, for having us on. Um, we're honored to, to be here and to be able to tell some of our story to you guys. Uh, I'm Alex Heim, uh, 33 years old. I'm the bottom of six kids. And I always tease everybody that my parents finally got what they were looking for when they got to me so they could quit at six. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, my family got into the bison industry in the late 60s. Uh, my, my uncle Ignatius and my, uh, or excuse me, my grandpa Ignatius and uncle Tony were very, very instrumental in the bison industry. Uh, Tony was, was up in Canada, did a lot of work back and forth between the United States and Canada. And um, actually he was tragically killed up there with his oldest son in Canada when they were hauling animals in 94, I believe. And so he's been gone for some time. He still has um, four kids that are remaining. His oldest son is on the, the original Hind Buffalo Ranch near Rockham, South Dakota. And so he still operates that. 
as a very nice Buffalo operation. Chad Heim is his name. And then my dad went into, Leonard is my dad. He went into the Navy out of high school. He was in the Navy for four years. When he got out of the Navy, he came back and started running bison again. And then we ended up down right on the east side of Fort Thompson, South Dakota, kind of in South, South Central South Dakota, um, not quite as far south as what we are now. And then we relocated down here in 2005. I was just getting done with high school. My parents bought a ranch closer to Winter, South Dakota. Then I went to Brookings to college for animal science for four years. When I graduated from SDSU, I moved out, um, started renting some land, running beef cows. We ran buffalo back and forth. I started um, producing meat animals when I was in high school alongside my dad. So we, we've been doing that, providing to the, some of the local um, butcher shops we take animals to. And then my parents actually ended up marketing quite a bit of meat when there were some tougher times in the early 2000s. So they started marketing quite a bit of meat in a, in more out of the necessity, necessity or necessity slash force, you could say, yeah. <laughs> than, than by choice. Um, but it went very well. They sold meat all over South Dakota and some of the surrounding states. And then the bison industry has really rose since the late 90s. It has really gained a lot of steam and people have realized how the quality of meat that it is. And that's what we've been able to do is, is to try to produce a quality consistent product to get to the consumer. And so we're getting better at that and making it available on a year round basis has been important. That way the consumer can, can choose to have that as part of their diet. And in 2011, um, I got married to my wife, Cassie, and, and we bought our first ranch that we own ourselves here by Wood, South Dakota. We're right straight south of the Osmonds, about 30 miles. So we're not too far apart. Straight, straight north, yeah. Yeah, straight yeah. north. They're straight south of us, excuse me. And, and then we've expanded our operation. Two years ago, we actually went all bison, sold, we ran about 400 mother beef cows. We sold all of those and transitioned to all bison. We're running about eight to 900 females on grass as we speak. Um, we still are in the beef industry a little bit as I have um, picks up some other lease ground that we can run beef on um, without having to fence and all of that. So, so that's where we sit today. Um, you know, we're running a nice buffalo herd. We strive every year to continue to improve our genetics and um, continue to do that. All right. Well, that's, that's neat stuff. I mean, the central part of South Dakota is a place that not a lot of people have been to, I imagine. I, I, used, I, I lived in Wyoming when I was in the Air Force and I had a girlfriend up in Rapid City, so I would zip up in there and, you know, Black Hills, uh, you know, uh, Mount Rushmore, that type of stuff. But when it comes to heading out the other part of South Dakota, you got to have a reason to go out there. And, you know, I don't know if many people get that way. But anyway, hey, let me ask you guys some general stuff. So you said buffalo and then bison. Is there a difference? Is there, is there a time? I know cause there's water buffalo and some, when, when, because a lot of people say buffalo and some people say bison. Is there, is there a precise term and when we should use those two terms? Well, we in the industry, we just kind of use them back and forth. And so that actually has created a, a downfall in our bison or North American buffalo market the last few years because with, with the bison gaining such popularity, there was water buffalo starting to be injected into our marketplace and they could label it as buffalo. But then you would look further down on ingredient list and you would see bison. So we're trying to train ourselves to refer to them as a bison instead of a buffalo. But they are a North American bison or a North American buffalo. So there is a, an extreme difference between a water buffalo and a North American buffalo. And, and that's controversial, whether people think we should be calling them a bison or a buffalo. Um, because the classic, iconic, you know, American West is, you know, a buffalo. They hunted the buffalo. That's but you know, we're trying to refer to them more as bison, but we go back and forth. But, yeah, Alex cleared that up pretty well, you know. 
So that's been something for the consumer out there when you are looking for for meat, for whether it's products for yourself or your pets, on your pet food is even a bigger thing. Make sure you buy bison. Because if you are buying a product that's labeled buffalo, these last few years, there's a really good chance you're not getting the North American buffalo or bison. You're actually getting the water buffalo, which there's millions of water buffalo. I didn't realize that until as of recently, how many water buffalo that are uh, very domesticated there are in the world. Yeah, so I mean, just, just for clarity, Buffalo refers to, to, a, to a class of animals around the world, and bison refers to just the nor- North American product that was native to North America, which we had classically thought of buffalo. We think of Buffalo Bill and all those things back in the 18, yeah. you know, late 1800s. That's it. So bison means North American buffalo, basically. So that's more, more specific. So now you say, because now you're saying water buffalo don't buy What's wrong with a water buffalo relative to a bison in your mind as far as product why 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 is a water buffalo not so because i know there's people in other parts of the world say india and stuff like that where they can't have cow but they're they might be able to have water buffalo what's the difference i i'm not i shouldn't i maybe should i'll clarify that i'm not condemning a water buffalo i'm just saying that's not what you're getting you know if you think you're getting a, a north american buffalo or north american bison and you're actually buying it with being buffalo you're not getting what you think you're yeah, and there's just, there's, you know, like Alex said, there's just millions of water buffalo, you know, throughout the world. Bison, there's, you know, I think, what are we, less than half a million? Yeah, less than half. Less than half a million bison, you know, so it's just a, it's a smaller market. What is, um, so let's talk between, you know, because cows and, you know, some people, you know, they look at a cow and look at a buffalo and they wonder how related are they. I mean, the cows... Due to my understanding, we're basically bred down from oryx, and I think you know we had all the all the domestic cows in the world were basically came from a handful of cows that were, I guess, in China, and then they bred them to to take over the world's population for domestic cattle. So, what is what is the differences, the general differences between because you guys have both beef cattle and bison uh, with regards to size, meat quality, the type of food. Uh, the, the the personality, I guess. I mean, in my understanding is buffalo are a little not as domestic, and I, I think maybe you guys are going to be able. To, I mean, maybe with enough breeding, you'll, you'll. I'm sure you select for the ones that are a little more controllable as time goes by. So you're not dealing with completely wild animals all the time. But tell me about the the general difference between beef and and bison. Well, um, so bison, they 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 have a different totally different bone structure. There's a lot of similarities between them, but they're not even, it's not even the same family. Is it? Yeah. And actually, back, just to jump back once, a water buffalo from a little bit of reading that I've done, a water buffalo actually ties back to a domesticated beef animal much closer than it does to the bison, which I found very interesting when they're called a buffalo. You would have thought there had been more similarities. Yeah, and, and generally, uh, bison are smaller than beef animals, generally. Um, people think they're a lot larger because of their hump, and that hump is actually a continuation of their vertebrates. It's not just a big fat pocket up there. Their vertebrates, and no one knows why, you know, because they look so goofy, you know, and, it, and there's, no one really knows why their vertebrates continue to, to form that hump, um, but generally, they, they, are, they don't weigh as much as like a typical beef cow are. Um, they're extremely athletic. They might not look like it, but they're, they're extreme athletes. Um, they're run, you know, they can run up to 40 mile an hour and they can get there just extremely quick. You know, they don't, they lumber around most of the time, but when they need to move they they can move, um, compared to a beef animal, beef animal, they're pretty lethargic, slow moving animals. Um, they, the personality, they, they're very intelligent. Um, they're a lot more intelligent than you can say a beef cow. Uh, when they look at you, they look you in the eyes, um, uh, and you know they're trying to figure out what you're doing. You know how you pull into the pasture. They know whether you know you're trying to. You know they know everything that's going on. So when we uh, when we uh, you know work with them, you just got to be smarter than the buffalo. You know there's we don't rodeo it up. You know when we go to gather and everything. We will lead them around generally, 
um, let them find the gate because when they find an open gate, they think that they, you know, they're getting into some fresh grass, into a fresh pasture. Um, so when we go, go you know, you leave the gate open, they, they all run in because they got to know what's through that, you know, into that fresh pasture. It's natural for them to keep moving. Um, so that's generally how, how we gather them is you open up the gate, leave them in. Um, they go from pasture to pasture and pretty soon before they knew it, they're in the corral. So that's how we, but anything else? All right. Yeah, we try to, you kind of try to work with them, you know, get them to do what they would want to do. And the big thing about them, sometimes they could be frustrating to you, but so much of what they do is based on survival. You know, when they're actually doing something, you have to step back and realize why, why are they looking at it that way? Why are they acting the way they are? You know, they're an animal that has evolved over years and years and years to survive. So you have to respect them for it. And it even comes down to the simple things. Like, so we are starting to graze, you know, more farm ground, um, starting to graze more of, you know, these little uh, laps and stuff like that, little pastures. We'll plant sedan grass in there. Well, on these, we've had several wet years. Well, the sedan grass grows way tall. Well, the bison, they, you know, they they just graze around the outsides and compared to beef cow, beef cow just walks in there, tramples over everything, you know, and they knock it down and they, bison, they just get what they need and graze on the outside. And no one, you know, no one can figure out why. Well, I think the reason is, is they get in there, they have no idea if there's predators, they can't see. So it's just every little thing, it's based on survival. Um, and they must be perfect for this area because, you know, they pretty well dominate the plains um, they don't look like it, you know, they're a goofy looking animal, uh, just based on from compared to beef or anything, but, you know, just a couple facts, I guess, about buffalo. Um, when I started doing some research and, you know, their trachea is about that big, where beef is trachea is about that big. And I thought it was just for air intake, you know, because they can run for miles, you know, and not slow down. But the reason they have the enlarged trachea is because it's more surface area. So when they breathe in cold air, the air is already warmed up to their body temperature before it gets to their lungs. You know, they just evolved as time went on. And also their hair, you know, if you go in like a square inch, uh, hair follicles in a square inch, they have, I think it's over twice as many hair follicles in a square inch than like the, like than a Highlander even does, you know, a Scottish Highlander beef cow. So, and, uh, and generally everything's the same, you know, we have our pairs, which, you know, buffalo generally breed, you know, right there in July, and it's a nine month gestation. So they're calving in that April area, May. Um, and you can't make them breed any earlier, any later. They just know they get adjusted to their, that area. And that's the only time they'll breed. And that's the only time they'll calve for the most part. Um, Cause they know that's the peak survival rate and, uh, and yeah, so as we got into the business, fencing obviously is, it's, it's not as big as an issue as a lot of people think, but you do have to have good fence, um, especially for your boundary fence. Our interior fences are nothing special. You know, we're rotating fast enough um, that they, you know, about, you know, like on our home place, um, we generally we're rotating pastures every eight, nine, 10 days. And about that 10 days, they're just waiting at the gate to go to the next pasture. Um, so they're not, in, and they're comfortable. This is home to them. They really don't want to go anywhere else. You know, if you, if they got out, if you just left them be, they'd be back in the next day. Because that's home. Um, so it's not as big as an issue as some of you think, but you do want to have good friends. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of interesting. A lot of people, you know, there's this regenerative agricultural movement going on among the beef cattle ranchers. And they, they talk about, you know, this is patterned after bison, you know, as they would move frequently due to avoiding predation. You know, the, the thought was they were, you know, being chased by wolves or whatever, whatever animal was going to eat them. And they would just move frequently and graze down the area and move and then the grass would recover. And you guys are kind of continuing to mimic that. Um, how much, well, it sounds like, I mean, you know, with, with cows in the wintertime up in South Dakota, as you know, as it, it gets, you got you to supplement with hay because there's no, 
the the bison can just cruise through on the on the on the snow and figure out how to eat. Is that is there a difference, or do you still have to hay those guys, or what's what's the deal on the bison? If you leave, as long as you leave adequate forage for them, yeah, they'll sweep. You know, they can sweep right through the snow um, and work and rut down in into that grass. Um, we do ha do some haying in the winter time. You know, it just depends on. On the rainfall we get throughout the summer and how much fall to winter grazing we have available. Um, there's some pieces of property that are more fit to, to hay to put into a round bale and then feed that to the animal in those winter months. You know more of the economics of it from the water, the fence, and, and then you can run on your, your other grasses in the summer with appropriate rotations. And on some of our ground that is leased from the reservation we're actually not allowed to graze during the winter months just because they're going you know they're used to beef cattle and that's just kind of the norms but like my you know our herd we we turn them out on a bunch of our organic fields you know or you know old organic you know corn stalks sunflower stalks and left some grass and they grazed all the way you know if we would have had just a little bit more we could have got by the grazing all year we did supplement a little bit you know in February and March before it did green up. But there is, you know, Buffalo, they, you can, if you have, you have the right, enough land, have the right rotation, have all the right fence and the water, you can, they can graze all year. That's, that's what, that's what they do. So. And that naturally, to jump back to their, their breeding, that naturally puts them in. So they calve on average, a lot of them calve in May. You know, because they're grazing that dormant grass, it's less nutritious. So then when they hit, they hit that green grass starting in April, you know, they'll have a calf come in late April, May, their plane of nutrition will start growing as that grass is flourishing, which then in return um, gets them to cycle. You know, it's, they've all, they're like a deer. I, I compare them to some people, I'll say they, they cycle more like a deer than they would, you know, a beef cow were, man, were manipulating them, um, you know. So that's that's what they've evolved to be. From a from a land usage standpoint, and I, I guess I would say acre per unit of meat produced, you know, a kilogram of meat or whatever. What, how do you compare bison versus cattle? You know, like I said, you know, obviously bison you say are a little smaller than cattle, but what's what's the land usage like comparing the two animals? Uh, this ain't a fact, it's my best opinion, <laughs> I'll give you. They're one, they're smaller. It's probably one of the biggest misconceptions of a bison is everybody thinks they're huge. They're actually not. The old bulls do get very large, but on the average, the cows, they're, they're smaller than beef cows. Not by much, but they but are a couple, hundred, a couple pounds. hundred pounds. So a couple hundred pounds per head. And then in the wintertime especially, their metabolism will slow way down because they evolved to do that and to survive on less. So they do eat less. I would say that's true. One, because they weigh less, and two, because their metabolism slows way down as it gets cooler. To go into the side on pounds of meat produced per acre, I, I don't know if I should comment on that. I, <laughs> I don't See, have that expertise. The bison industry is so small. Um, the studies that are done, I mean, they're limited. You know, it's such a small business. So there's another fact. If we killed bison like we killed beef in this country, every bison would be dead in five days is it? or less. Like everyone, every cow, calf, bull, everything, like kill beef. So it's, it's just such a smaller industry that it's, it's about impossible. To get. There are some studies now that they're working on getting funded, but to, to do studies like that, it's just, it's tough to – you know, the, to have the incentive for a university to spend the money and spend the time to do a study on bison. So, but generally they, they are more efficient um, as far as eating less and making, and they're a lot better foragers than cattle are too. You know, they utilize the land better, I would say, than, than you know, they're eating more, they eat the sedges, they're eating forbs, you know, different things that maybe a cow wouldn't eat or they graze it differently. Do um, 
do you have to take any special measures against predators up there? I mean, do you find that the are they pretty pretty tough animals to kill? Or they no, our predators have to take special measures against the buffalo out here. So <laughs> yeah, there's there's no issues there. Um, uh, they they are like during. I don't think there would be anything really meaner on the plains than a mother bison cow with her calf. I mean, there's really nothing you can do. Other than there is that instinct to stay with the herd, you know, that's that survival instinct. You know, generally there's nothing you could ever do, you know, like like Alex, only like those baby baby buffalo calves like Velcro on their mom. But if, if the calf is naturally, if you have a calf that's weaker, but like there, another comparison to beef versus bison, like a beef calf, you know, he hits the ground, it's an hour, you know, before he's up and sucking with a bison, you never even really see them on the ground. I mean, they hit the ground, those little guys, they're 30, 40 pounds, and they're up sucking and they're running 30 mile an hour, you know. It's just amazing, really. They're, they're, the survival is so strong, that instinct, because, you know, they made it through the ice age, you know, so making it through their survival, the, the only ones that made it through them smart enough to survive and evolve. I mean, it, let's go back and talk about, I mean, because the bison population was uh, nearly completely wiped out in the late 1800s. You know, we had uh, trophy hunting, and it was kind of a shame. You saw they were hunting them for uh, their hum- different different parts, uh, horns and humps, and I can't remember what, the, what the, they weren't even, they were just throwing away the meat back then, and I think some of that was done in part to help to uh, defeat the Native American resistance because that was their food supply, but how how low did the bison population get and then where are we at today and where does it what does the future hold for for bison uh, right now it's anticipated there's about 400,000 bison that's the number to the best of you know the national bison association there was a, a pretty strong movement they launched a couple of years ago at the national conference in denver you know 1 million bison and to try to get to get to that number so one thing with that growth, we have to make sure things grow together. You know, we can't just have a bunch of growth. You know, 100,000 animals doesn't seem like much to the beef sector. They kill more, they kill that many in a day. Well, to us, that's 25%, you know, so all of a sudden it's a huge factor of, and, and keeping the, the sales of, of meat you know, at equal to what the, the volume of animals, so that way it can support, um, yeah, support as, one another. And as far as the historic numbers, that ranges. There's some there's some people that say it's less than a thousand. Um, I don't. No one really knows what the number is. You know, there's other people that say it was you know up to seven thousand. I've heard before, um, but it got down. It's pretty lean there. You know, in South Dakota, Scotty Phillips. Um, was one of the main movements, you know, he was one of the first bison ranchers, I guess you could say, in South Dakota. Um, and he actually, so a little bit of history, um, Alex's uncle got Sandy Limper into the bison business back in the early 90s. Or, yeah. yeah, early 90s. And so that's the Slim Buttes Ranch in western South Dakota. And in the Slim Buttes, that was one of the, there was a small herd of wild animals in the Slim Buttes. Um, and Scotty Phillips, that's where he roped some of his first buffalo calves off horseback. Here's a story, which I don't know how you would get a buffalo calf roped off a horseback because they're just the meanest little, toughest little things ever. But apparently he did, it, you know, that would have been in 1800, that, you know. And so that's, a connection. A connection. You know, you know, how, and then years later, obviously Sandy Limpert bought Slim Butte's ranch and wasn't making any money in beef cattle. And Alex's uncle got him into ranching bison. And then we ended up buying our first animals from Sandy Limpert in early 2017. So that's a little connection. You know, it's the bison industry is a small industry, a small world. And so there's just connections everywhere. But, you know, with, you know, the beef industry being so large and, you know, obviously designed for efficiency and 
uh, you know, we have all these USDA processing centers, which some some ranchers are not too thrilled about because it adds additional cost to thing. How how are bison processed? Do you have do you have the same hurdles? Do you have to go through USDA? Uh, same same type of things. And, and do you, is it harder to to process bison just because everything's set up for beef, or do you go to specialty processors, or how does that work? Not very similar. They are a little harder to process just because of like their skin. They have a thick hide and a thicker hair. So when they go to skin them out, it, is, it does take them a little longer. They do, one other thing that I found out as of recently is some of these plants have went away from using a gun to kill the animal because of regulations with the gun regulations. So they'll use a bolt gun, you know, a bolt thumper. And as a rule, that don't work on bison. Because we looked at having a facility possibly process some stuff for us with our meat business. And so that is also limited what, um, what you can do and who can do that. The other thing would be, would be before the, you know, when you go to unload them at a facility, that's where it takes a little better corral setup to be able to come off your trailer and, and go into a holding pen before they are put through the process. Um, but otherwise, once you get them broke down, I mean, that's not any issue as far as the carcass itself. It'd be more from that live animal, you know, from the skinning earlier, not to the processing of the carcass. The one thing with bison, because they're, they're still considered a non-amenable species, so we can actually, you can have state inspection, they can be processed under state inspection and they can cross into other states where with beef they have to be federally inspected to cross into other states now with bison when you go some plants are federally inspected even though they wouldn't have to be but to go for export they need to be federally inspected so a lot of the bigger plants are federally inspected but when they're federally inspected that inspection is not paid for by the federal government because on the state level it would be. So on the federal level, it adds, there's a cost there where state is provided by the state. So there's a fee when they go to the federal inspection level. Yeah, so I mean, you can, so you can butcher steaks outside of a USDA facility and sell them across lines, across state lines is what you're saying. You can sell individual Correct. steaks. Whereas a beef cattle producer in South Dakota couldn't do that. Yeah, so that's-, that's They have it. changed some of, I know there's some of the, on the political side with COVID, they're actually getting some of that flaw, um, Wild. adjusted like in the surrounding states. It's not a nationwide thing, but some of the states are working together with some of that meat shortage to allow, you know, say animals to come from South Dakota that were butchered in a state inspected facility to be shipped to Wyoming or Nebraska. You guys, uh, it seems like, you know, well, I mean, obviously the, the bison roamed the plains and into Canada and the northern regions. Are they pretty much, is that where they're at? Or do, are people running them in Texas and other places where the climate's hot? Or are they hardy enough where they can go all ranges of, of temperature? Yeah, there's bison in for sure all 50 states. Um, there's a herd in Hawaii. Uh, we, uh, my grandpa was the one that shipped him over there, and my uncle. <laughs> I don't know the year off the top of my head, but they were. Yeah, they. So there's still a herd there today. Yeah, they. That's. It's just wild. They they look different than the ones here because they don't have any hair. You know, they're they kind of bald. And they just have, you know they're not bald. But they just have short hair. But yeah, they're they're real adaptable. They obviously do best. There's kind of a teardrop. You know that they do where they initially roam. You know it's down in there, you know, Panhandle, you know, Texas, Oklahoma, and it comes up through the Dakotas and Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, and it goes up through Canada. Then, you know, kind of to, that's kind of the, that's the prime areas that they run. Um, they do really well where we're at, you know, we're kind of right in the center part of that two drop where they ran. Um, you know, we, where we're at, honestly, you know, people say, oh, I have the best grass in the world, but as far as the United States goes, this area is some of the best grass in the world. Well, it, and, and by that, it makes it expensive as well. Um, you know, it's expensive to run animals here, but um, 
in our native grasses. So we, you know, mainly run on native grasses. We do do plant some sedan grass and graze our, some of our farm ground as cover crop. Um, but, you know, we have, you know, all the species of native grass and right, right here where we're at is some of the prime land in the United States for grazing, so. Not on a volume base. A volume base would be less, yeah. but the performance base on that grass is so nutritious. Yeah, it's all native grasses, you know, meant to grow here. And so the nutrition level is just higher, you know, and micronutrients, everything. It's, especially when you get, and we're working on this, you know, to get everything back in balance, you know, through the rotating. Um, we, I went to my first uh, regenerative grazing class in 2017. And we had, you know, we had done, when we had beef cattle, we rotated grazing, but it wasn't, you know, super intensive. And we just saw that it was better, you know, and, and that's, so we did, but I didn't really understand it. And then we went to that first class and then we started working with Crossroads Rangeland Consulting um, uh, for rotational grazing, you know, Raw and Cruz. And I went to that, and then we went out and looked at a Buffalo Ranch, Triple Seven Buffalo Ranch in Western South Dakota, and it was just amazing. You know, I was seeing grass; they were seeing grasses that people haven't seen in years come back. Um, you know, Western South Dakota typically you think short grass, you know, tough, dry. Well, they were having all the native species, you know, all the big loose ends are going to come back, and I was like, whoa, you know, there's something to this. Um, and so then we've been doing it ever since then. And, just in the short years we have been doing, the improvements have been amazing to the rangeland. Like it's and the animals too, because they're staying ahead of the parasites, um, staying ahead of you know keeping that natural movement through. And and Alex has has got a he's got a bigger herd that he's doing this intense grazing with, and so his results I think are going to even be more than ours because the way our land is, you know, we have four herds. Um, you know, each from 270 head down to 180. And so we're doing, you know, as best we can to keep them moving, you know, from that 10 day range. And Alice has got heard of five. Yeah, there's about 520 mother cows plus bulls and then all their calves. Now that's a, another feat in itself is dealing with that many animals, you know, getting them to go through, getting them to go through just a gate. You know what I mean? You want to make sure they, they're good about going through in a nice orderly fashion, you know, but sometimes they get excited. And they get excited and, and they, they go. go. Yeah, so. You guys mentioned uh, genetics and breeding. What, what kind of things are, what, what are the goals? I mean, is it, is it to produce an animal that is better adapted to the environment, that can produce more meat per kilogram of feed? I mean, what, what's, uh, or forage, what's, uh, what's the goal on the, on, the, on the genetic side? What are we looking to do? Well, overall, um, you're looking for efficiency overall, you know, as far as um, grazing and then just the lifespan. You know, you're, you're look, it's similar to beef. You're looking for an animal that is well-built, well-structured, well-muscled, so that they, you know, bison, they can last. They can be producing calves still when they're 20 years old and some even older. Um, compared to a beef cow, that's 8, 9, 10, 11 years old. You know, bison, they, they have a lot longer longevity. And so you're looking for, to, to breed the ones that will produce every year and then produce a calf that's a quality animal, you know, because genetics directly correlate with the final product. You know, if you have, you know, animal that muscles better, um, you know, gains weight faster and the final product is going to be that much better. And that's very clear. Like that is very cut and dry. Higher quality animals produce higher quality meat. That's just the way it is. So we really focused on that. Um, you know, we bought our first animals and most animals from one of the higher quality herds in the United States or in the world, I guess. And then we really focused on our bull power, you know, having high quality animals. And we post pictures of that on social media, you know, and you can tell that you can just see they're just impressive animals. And that's something we focus on because it it really is one of the most important factors because there's they got down to you know a thousand head of buffalo so and that and that was not very long ago so there's a lot of animals that are not as high quality of genetics and so 
we key on the higher quality of the genetics because there's not that many of them. And we just want to produce better animals, more efficient animals every year that will live longer and produce the most amount, produce the most amount of meat on the least amount of land as possible. You know? And with, you know, there's no artificial, artificial insemination. You know, the, the bison industry is an all natural industry. So they got to produce naturally. Um, yeah, and the higher quality animals, they're more likely to breed back better, get a higher conception rate as well. You know, poorer animals that just naturally, you know, they don't carry their weight as good. They don't keep the weight on and keep the weight on as good during the winter time. They're not going to produce. And like you said, also, I mean, you do want to have personality. I mean, you don't want to turn them into beef cow, but also if you have the animals that are super high strung aggressive they're not gonna they you know they're gonna get more excited you know around the other animals and every and everything and screw her up and cause more stress everything we do is we we do the little possible to minimize as much stress as possible um mice very easily are stressed out because they're you know they're still a wild animal i mean they are and so we, we minimize that, and then you do pick for the genetics to keep them low stress. But you also don't want to have them be your pets. Because if they get to where there's no fear of you, that's the worst thing. You know, you want to have that mutual respect between you and the animals. Otherwise, that's where all that's where the issues are in the bison world. You know, you see like Yellowstone and everything, they're around people every day. They see these people, you know, um, and they just get, you know, they're coming eating you know, eating out of the car or whatever, they get to where there's that respect isn't there. So then when it does come breeding season, does come, you know, calving season, if they see a human, they're like, well, that could be an issue. So we're just going to deal with that issue. You know, that's, you know, that's kind of, I guess you could kind of say. Yeah. You know. what, what's the uh, time frame from uh, birth to, to slaughter weight? And uh, is it comparable to like a grass fed beef animal, which is, you know, 24, 28 months? What's, what's the time frame for you guys on that? Correct. It would be similar. And that's, uh, that's where the kind of the genetics comes back in is to have these better animals that will perform, you know, that will perform because once you get over about 30 months of age, there's a change in the meat structure. And then having this quality meat product is tough to get. So but without, you know, turning into burger, grind is, is obviously fine, but your steaks and roast, you know, the tenderness is a very direct correlation to the age of that animal. And so a poor genetic animal, you know, you won't get to that level where you can harvest him at an appropriate age if you don't have that genetic profile there. Yeah, that's why we keep track, you know, of all that information. Not everybody does, you know. Most of the animal bison or, you know, or it would be in the hands of, oh, uh, you know, like the state parks, reservations, preserves. So there's not that, there's not that need for efficiency as much. You know, the performance. The performance. And the economics, you know, this is, uh, there's a lot of people that, that raise bison purely for hobby Aesthetic. or just be, because they can. Um, and we, we, we make our living. I mean, that's how we want to manage the grasslands, provide for our families and our coming generations is, is the economics. So the economics have to be there. Uh, we don't do it for just fun. <laughs> <laughs> it is a lot of fun. <laughs> Yeah, let me ask you, because uh, somebody, and I know you guys do this, you, you guys provide your beef online direct to consumer, you know, and, and I've had the fortune of, 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 you guys sent me some to try and it was damn good. Um, one thing I noticed about bison and, and well, I, I think across the board, and, and yours was no exception, um, is when I eat grass finished beef, it tastes sort of, I, I guess it depends on how they do it. I mean, there's obviously different ways to finish that on grass. It often tastes very gamey. I didn't notice that with bi the bison for some reason. I don't know if it's a difference in the end. What is the difference in the meat between bison meat and, and, and you know, beef cattle? Is there, how would you qualitatively describe the differences? I, I mean, uh, you could say it's more tender. Um, 
And it's all about the age too. You know, what age, what time frame you, you get it, you know, it, you get them to wait. Um, the type, uh, the type they, of what they're on, the time of year when you harvest them, a lot of that stuff can greatly vary. There's so many factors, even stress, you know, stress leading up, you know, age. The one thing, and, and this is, unfortunately, there is a lot of product that comes into the marketplace that isn't even from the United States. You know, that there's a, there's a lot of that that happens, you know, in the, on the beef side. You know, they'll come from these other countries where that's readily available. And so that could be, could be, you know, I don't know, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's the point. A lot of the, a lot of the beef cattle ranchers are looking to get the cool law, uh, you know, re reinstituting the country of origin labeling, which was, which was, I think, re reversed in, I want to say 2014 or something like that, where, you know, you, you could know where your beef was coming from. And, and now they can, you know, it could be from Namibia or, you know, Mexico or, Brazil or wherever, you know, and then people talk about the differences in processing standards and ethical standards and so on and so forth. So that's something yeah. that, you know, hopefully that'll get reinitiated. And I think most, most American ranchers, whether the bison or beef would like to see that return. The beef packing industry doesn't necessarily want to do that because they get more, they, they make more money when they can grind up some cheap beef from Mexico and mix it in with the U S beef and call it product of the USA. So that's uh, I think the World Trade Organization got in, pissed off about it or something. I can't remember all the details. I know there's a lot of political stuff on there, but as a consumer, it's nice to know where your beef is coming from. Whether you think U.S. beef is better or not, it's still nice to know where it is. Um, how um, I was going to say, how, the animals when they when they reach peak weight, what is the weight? Are they around a thousand pounds or something like that? I mean, I'm looking at a cow; it's more it's like. Nice to have the the males, the bulls. That, that's another thing with with bison; they're all left bulls. They're all left intact, and yeah, no hormones, no no, no steering them, none of that. and they're all left intact. And so we we like them to be around 1,150 pounds is a nice nice size animal. And then on the female side, the heifers. They're around that 900, 900 to 950 pounds is the, the average and ideal size we shoot for. Yeah, and do you guys, uh, I guess you guys send everything off for, for processing. You don't do any slaughter on site yourself, do you, or no? No. Currently, everything is sent off. We've worked with a couple different outfits, you know, that, um, that have bought animals from us and then as well as are processing our own uh, for Dakota Pure Bison for our own meat label that we've launched in the last couple of months. And do you guys get into the sort of the other, I mean, a lot, cause most people don't realize this, but beef are much more, you know, these grazing animals are much more than just meat. I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're every part of them is utilized, whether it's the hide, whether it's the leather, whether it's the fur, whether it's a horn, you know, the bones, it's turned into gelatin and household products. And I mean, it's, these animals are used pretty much a hundred percent. There's basically no waste left. I assume that's the same thing with the bison. Is that correct? Greg, yeah, the leather and stuff has been very sought after in some of the stalls for artwork. Um, we have experienced, because of all these synthetics, we have experienced a, a decline in the value of like hides, especially, we would say, in both the bison and the beef, which is very unfortunate. So hopefully, you know, that can, can regain popularity and be utilized, but um, it is still utilized. There's just very little value. <laughs> it's more you know, than that. You know, if you get to where that was more utilized, it's like, you know, less synthetics, that, that dollar will come directly down the chain back to the producer. You know, it, you know, it, it's basically not a factor right now for us. You know, it's just, you know, because it's just such – it's just the value isn't there. So, yeah. And do you guys get much into? Because I don't know. Are you distributing? I mean, are you going to the processor and then they're bringing it back to storage facility? Do you guys for to you guys to ship direct to, to consumer? How how does that working for you guys? So right at the beginning, we were we were shipping just a little. That was just on the Antelope Creek Bison, just on our ranch. We were shipping a little, and you know it's pretty intensive having the storage space. So we actually got a partnership. Um, with Dakota Warehouse, and they're fulfilling all of our orders for us. 
And that's been a great partnership for us. They, you know, we designed all of our boxes, we designed the insulation, um, and kind of did some tests and practice. They've really worked with us for shipping. You know, we use their shipping, ship FedEx. Um, we do ship, you know, we answer, you send Dakota if you're a message, it's me, Alex, or Kate, you know, Kate is our sector worker, Cassie, we're the ones replying. Um, you know, any questions you have, when you message, you're messaging us. You know, we might be on a four-wheeler or out in a pickup, fix and fence, but we're, we are re replying back to you guys. Um, but, and we ship our hats and our t-shirts, you know, we ship all them just through us. We just have it in the office there, but no, we do ship from a warehouse out in uh, Rapid City, South Dakota. Um, so those guys are those guys are really good out there. They've been good partners. For They've us. been great to work with. Where we're a startup company, lots of firsts. <laughs> <laughs> lots of firsts. <laughs> so um, they've been real good uh, to help us with that and working through that. You know, from boxes and insulation, and we did not think the biggest <laughs> issue in a meat company would be having the right size boxes to get them shipped. <laughs> you know. Um, you know, we thought getting them raised and getting them killed was hard. The boxing and packaging, that's a whole different thing. Um, uh, but no, it's been, you know, everyone, when we first started talking about it, we had a lot of people who were just like, you know, guys, this is like a big step. We're like, well, you know, other people can do it. Why couldn't we do it? You know what I mean? So, and we didn't, I don't think a lot of people didn't think we were actually going to do it. So we did it. You know, when we started looking into this in 20, early 2019, probably, and we started working into it and how we got together, I guess, the Osmond and the Hines is we were, Alex was, you know, just up the road here. I didn't really know Alex that well, knew of him. And then we're starting to think about getting the vice center. So we just kind of started talking back and forth. And then Alex was a huge help, you know, just as far as advice and, you know, having to borrow equipment, borrow whatever for us getting our business started. And his whole family has just been, you know, great for us. And so we just kind of started talking about, you know, getting something going. You know, we have the capacity to do it. We have the animals. Um, so we decided to team up there and, you know, kind of late 2019, we started talking about it. And we'd actually got the ball rolling on Dakota Pure, you know, like we got the logo design. That was a, that was a process. We got them designed here in South Dakota, local company and, and uh, work awesome work with them, you know, digital designs out of Rapid City, and had a lot of fun designing that. And then got the logo design, and then we were working on, already working on, you know, maybe messing around the website, messing around the idea, and then COVID hit, and we are like, okay, it's go time. So, but then everything was, with everyone is at 50%, you know, a lot of companies, they only have 50% of people, so it took us, Long and we thought to get up and going, but we wanted everything to be right before we started. We didn't want to go off half cocked. But a lot of people were saying, you know, you got to be going right now, but we still wanted, you know, we had to do test shipments. We were sending test shipments to family in Arizona and friends in Oregon. And, and uh, you know, really one of the main reasons why we started to go to Pure is we just don't see why there's any reason why people, everybody isn't eating bison, you know. It's a higher quality product. There's more protein. Um, we raise it right here. You know, why, why can't everybody eat it? You know, and so that's, that's one of the main reasons we did it. Greg, we want to make sure everybody has it available to them. And, and we want them to be able to see, have a, a good idea where their product is coming from. You know, and so you have to expose, you know, from the social media, you know, all of a sudden you have to expose some of your operation to to the public and and, and then we're that's a different for us too yeah. you know, we're not you know that's not really what we're into but and we need to get better at that you know but we're we're working on it yeah i tell you uh, the, the social media aspect is 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 big and is getting only getting bigger and so it's i think you're, you're you're silly if you don't capitalize on that hey one other question some of the people in here, and, and you know, our, I know our community, a lot of them are interested in, in bison as, as an interest, so maybe maybe we'll get some folks that will you know, go your way and, and order from you guys. But do you guys ever consider, or do you, because I know a lot of us will eat things like bone marrow, and so you know, you've got those femurs. You know, a lot of people can new cut those where they just kind of band some or whatever to cut them in half and 
some people like to order actual fat. I mean, they actually still appreciate the fat. And so some of the suet and things like that, is that is something you guys are able to do or can think about doing? We plan to expand uh, a lot more, you know, but when we start, um, we have to, to be able to control everything, you know, when you're shipping it. And then even one thing, so people are aware, you know, you get down to portion cutting a steak. This is just one example. So every steak is, you know, if you want this filet, it's eight ounces, or this ribeye is 10 or 12 ounces. And right now, our steaks are not portion cut. I mean, they come more natural, you would say. And by doing that, we can be a hair more efficient because you're getting this true steak size. Now, also, that makes it hard for us to be able to put that into our system. So when someone goes on our website, wants to create an order, you know, they can't pick and choose because it, it needs to be able to generate an invoice while they're there. And there, there could be a package of ribeyes that, that may weigh, one, of them, one package could be 2.1 pounds. All of our packages have two steaks. But a one package could have 2.1 pounds and one could have 2.3 pounds. So when people see on our, our website currently, that's why we have boxes and it shows the, the amount of steaks or roast or burger. The burger's all one pound because that, that's simple to do. But your steaks, you're taking something and, and changing its form. We will get into making it portion cut so we're more flexible for the consumer. But in the startup, we just haven't been able to do that. See, we wanted to get going here, you know, we wanted to make it simple for for us and for our consumers. So they can go on and they can get a box of meat. You know, we have, we have a lot of different options and it's, it's kind of everything that you, re, you know, the main items that you really want, you know, and we, we just keep it for them. And then uh, we have had, a, even on, on your live videos, um, that we get on Sean and, and some of the other videos or comp posts you made for us, which we thank you for doing. Um, but people say, well, it's just, it's too expensive. Maybe one day. Um, if you break it down, our costs are extremely efficient because the way we do it, you know, we're, you're getting more meat, you know, you're not getting a portion cut steak. So instead of being 12 ounce ribeye, it could be 16, 17 ounce ribeye, but you're really, our prices are like, so if you look on like our quarter package and our other package, you're getting, if you break it down, you're getting extremely good value for your product. Like I think our quarter package is like, it's about burger price. It's about burger price, and you're getting the fillets, which some fillets can run up fifty dollars a pound. And you're getting it for that eleven, twelve bucks a pound. So I, that's what I just like to say, people. You know, it can seem like a lot, and we are today. We are building a box. It's going to be a ninety-nine dollar box. That is one thing we we're working on, and we confirmed it on Friday. They're probably cutting our boxes as we speak over right over here in South Dakota. That's the other cool thing. We're trying to focus everything in South Dakota and the United States, you know, like hats, United States shirts, or maybe U.S. Um, and boxes are cut in Sioux Falls, uh, you know, butchered out in Rat City in the Black Hill area, Black Hills area, um, stored, shipped from uh, South Dakota. We're trying, to, we're trying to keep it the way we believe it should be, you know, like keep, keep it local. And uh, so that that's, it, you know, our boxes, it might seem like a lot, but it's it's a deal you know you are getting a deal for probably the highest quality bison meat you can get you know we don't want to say that ours <laughs> is better than somebody else's but it is an extremely high quality and you're utilizing the whole animal yeah you're getting mm -hmm. when you buy those boxes you're getting a part of everything you know yeah i, I i'll say you know again and you guys were kind enough to send me some and i certainly enjoyed it and i can brad said it's delicious and nutritious and good stuff um, let, we've been through an hour, so that's usually what we end up doing. And, I, and I, I thank you guys for your time. Once again, thank you for what you do. Let people know where they can find out, where they can purchase the, 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 your, your product, where they can follow you on social media. All right, so um, our website is dakotapurebison.com. Um, you can go on there and do any orders. And then we're on Instagram at Dakota Pure Bison, Facebook, Dakota Pure Bison. And all of those websites, you know, we do tech products all the time. You click right through Facebook, take you right to the website. Um, pretty simple. We do, you know, different product features. 
Um, we are working on that $99 box. We'll be that is hopefully be out in the next couple of weeks. Um, but you can get anything from, you know, a box of burger all the way up to a whole quarter of an animal. Um, kind of nationally how it is. But yeah, we're Dakota Pure Bison, Facebook, Instagram. Um, I'm Scott Osmond. I'm on Facebook and Instagram. Alex Hein, he's on Facebook and Instagram. You can also follow our ranches, our ranch set Facebook page. So um, I'm on uh, Antelope Creek Bison is on Facebook. You can see what we're doing. I've been focused more on the Dakota Pure lately. So it's basically the same thing. And then Heinland Bison is on Facebook too. So you can see what we're doing at our ranches as well. Yeah, we need... Uh, we need to get you on the Meter X linked in the website because we have a bunch of producers and, and, and folks that there. So if you guys don't mind, we'd love to feature you guys as, as one of our producers for, for this community. But anyway, guys, thanks again for what you do. Um, and for the members here, thanks for tuning in. Uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Take care. Thanks, thanks Scott. Alex, appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you.